Chen, welcome to uh, Time with the Captains live here on TV3. We've got our captain for the month of March. Uh, let me just quickly introduce him to you. He grew up and schooled in Salt Pond. He attended the Catholic Boys Primary School, uh, known as Saito uh, School, because, um, you know, he used to wear khaki uniforms then. He sold sweets and coconuts to make pocket money back then. Uh, his parents moved to Accra uh, just when he was 11 years old. He attended Prince of Peace Academy in Medina, uh, where he sat for his common entrance exams. He later went to the UK and worked in a factory for the very first year. Got a job with Lloyds Bank in 87 after 200 job applications. He did all sort of jobs, all jobs, I tell you, uh, during his holidays to earn extra money to support his parents and siblings back home in Ghana. His big break was in 1994 when he managed to get a job with Merrill Lynch as a management accountant. Uh, his other big break came in 1997 when he started working as a freelance business analyst with Japanese bank, uh, Nomura Bank, implementing financial trading applications. Since then, he's done uh, quite a number of things, worked with a number of uh, institutions. He worked for numerous financial institutions like the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in Germany, uh, Shortest Asset Management in London, the Bank of England, and the Credit Suisse uh, before returning back home in 2007. Uh, things didn't work out that much. Uh, he went back to work for UBS Bank in London for a year, moved finally to Ghana in 2008, started working uh, on Zen Petroleum in 2009. He won his very first contract supplying fuel uh, to Goldfields Mines in 2010, worked on his own driving up down to Takwa three times a week uh, for the first three months. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the man who has since gone on to win the fuel and lubricant supply and management contract with a number of mining companies in Ghana, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, uh, as well as being the largest supplier to the mines in Ghana, employing over 300 staff. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome the currently fourth largest oil marketing company in Ghana after Goyle, Vivo, and Total, Mr. William Terrier. Thank you, Mr. Terrier, for your time. And good to have you on time with Thank the captains. Uh, how does it feel when you got the invitation to come on the program? I'm um, very nervous. I'm not comfortable talking in front of a camera, so mm. um, I'm quite a private person. But um, pleasure to be here because um, I appreciate the number of students here who, in some ways, are a bit like how I was um, maybe 30, 40 years ago. How were you 30, 40 years ago? Um, I was a hustler, <laughs> trying to make it in life. You know, trying to get somebody to guide me, trying to get somebody to advise me on how to go about life, how to try to make it, um, how to make a bit of money, that sort of thing. So um, there are quite a number of people who influenced me in a very positive way, gave me good advice. So I feel, you know, it's an obligation on my part to also share my experience. Some of it might be relevant, some might not be, but um, to share it as honestly as I can. And hopefully it might motivate or encourage some of them to to do even better than, than we have done. Right. So you attended the Presbyterian Boys Secondary School in 1979. Yes. Uh, you left for the UK after your A-levels in June 1986. Yes. You did not attend university. I didn't, no. I couldn't afford to. What does that mean? Um, couldn't afford to. I had to work immediately. I left um, Ghana. The whole idea was to find a job and start working and making money straight away. So you know, I, I didn't have the luxury of going to university. So how do you find yourself in the UK? Um, managed to put some money together to <laughs> get a plane ticket and jumped on board. My, my sister was working there at the time, so she, she got me a job you know, doing um, odd jobs here and there. So that's, that's how I ended up there. And ever since, you've done a lot of jobs, worked with a number of financial institutions, you've hustled in life. Yeah. You came back to Ghana to start up Zen Petroleum. How did the whole idea of starting a petroleum company start? It was pure coincidence. You know, this, this wasn't something that was um, engineered. This wasn't some you know, bright spark moment. It was just a pure coincidence. I happened to be talking to, um, you know, to a few people who introduced me to um, some mining uh, managers, gold fields in particular. Um, they had issues getting quality fuel from, from the, the, the incumbent supplier at the time. Um, and asked if that was something I might be interested to look at. Um, I honestly didn't think that there was a lot of value I could add because at the time they were being supplied by a big multinational and I didn't really see what I could do differently. Um, 
but I thought it, w it was worth looking at. It, it sounded interesting, so I spent probably six months just trying to understand the downstream petroleum sector. Um, once I established that these um, so-called multinationals don't actually import fuel, and um, the fuel in Ghana is imported by bulk distribution companies, they're called BDCs. So no multinational in Ghana actually imports any fuel. The transport, although you see big multinational companies advertising their names on their, their trucks, they don't own a single truck. It's all owned by Ghanaians. You know, the largest, some of the largest transporters are the likes of um, J.K. Hogley, S.O. Frimpong, Spenhall, guys like that, uh, uh, companies like that. They, they actually own the trucks. So it was very clear at the beginning that these multinationals who claim to have um, you know, so control of the, the mining business in Ghana were not actually adding very, very much value. They were just buying from... Third party. Yeah, they are buying from a Ghanaian importer and using a Ghanaian to do a transport. And it was, to my mind, this was something that... I a could local could do. Mm. I didn't see why not. So I thought, you know, it, it was worth looking at. And as I said, spent a number of, of months tr just trying to understand the downstream sector did a presentation to Goldfields Mine in 2009. Without any formal education in mining, no experience at all, you just went in there, you studied it for six months. They just wanted fuel. That's all they wanted. <laughs> they didn't want anything else. So that's what I was focused on. I wanted to understand what the incumbent supplier was doing to get the fuel to them. It was explained to me that somebody imports it, someone else transports it. I asked one of the, the importers um, if they would support me if I, if I was successful. Um, they said, why not? I asked the transporter if he would transport for me. He said, why not? And that was it. I said to, to Goldfields at a time, I'm going to do exactly the same thing as what these multinationals are doing. No different. Didn't you need any startup capital? Um, fortunately, at the time, I didn't because we didn't... At that time, Goldfields was not doing consignment stock, which mm. means that the stock, as soon as it's delivered, belongs to them. So you didn't actually, we're getting credit from the, the supplier. You didn't have to pre-finance. We didn't have to pre-finance. Mm. So the, the BDC, who was importing the products, will give you some credit, and you pass that credit on to the mining company. Mm. And as long as you, when you collect the money from the mining company, you make sure that you pay your supplier and you don't divert the money. Mm. Um, you were good. You didn't need financing. Mm. So that's how you started. And you turned over $30 million in the first year of operations with a profit of $20,000. I was working for free. I was literally working for free. So the importer gives a product to us. We supply it to the mine. And every penny that they pay us goes back to the importer. The balance goes to, to the transporter. How did you ever think in your mind that this would make you a big business tycoon someday? Um, the honest answer is I didn't. I just thought that it's an interesting idea, it's a different sector. As you said at the beginning, my background was in a completely different industry. It was in the banking industry. Um, it was exciting to get involved in a, in a different type of business. So I was 100% motivated. What motivated me more was when the incumbent supplier at the time a multinational company said to go fields that the biggest mistake they can make is to entrust their fuel supplies to a local Ghanaian supplier. They said to them it will not work. So I just wanted to try and prove them wrong. That was my motivation. I didn't really care too much about how much money I could make out of it. And what I knew was that what was clear in my mind was that if I can supply go fields without slipping up, other opportunities will come out of that. If you can supply the largest mine in Ghana with fuel continuously without running them dry, and you could supply decent quality fuel at Unadulterated some point. Unadulterated fuel. Exactly. Um, at some point, that's going to open up opportunities. So I just wanted to get my foot through the door. And thankfully, Goldfields gave me that opportunity, and uh, the rest is history. And lastly, you think you've succeeded in doing that? Um, so far, we haven't done too badly. We, we supply the majority of the, the mines in Ghana. You know, as I said, we started from a zero base. We supply the majority of them. We employ um, over 300 Ghanaian professionals in the mining space. We've never run a man, mine dry, i.e. we've always had fuel for them. We've now gone beyond just supplying the mines. We now build fuel facilities on the mining site. 
We've, um, we've constructed the largest on-site fuel facility on any mine in West Africa at Goldfields in Takwa. Um, again, that was something that the multinationals said no Ghanaian can do. And um, what's interesting when they say things like that is that they themselves don't construct it. They outsource it to third parties. So when somebody says to you, you can't do something because you're a Ghanaian, what you've got to realize is that if you own a business, you don't do everything yourself. You outsource some of it to experts. So if you come into Zen Petroleum, for instance, there's a limit to how much I know. The experts, are, are the, the, all the 300 plus people who are working there, they understand the detail of what we do. So if you own a business, all you're doing is creating an environment to get experts to do what they do best. And you are just managing you know, the expectations, you're managing expectations of the clients, and you're working as a team. So this idea that Ghanaians cannot do this, Ghanaians cannot do that, it's a complete fallacy. I'm surely going to come to my uh, audience to, to get their questions, but That's fine. you started this all by yourself? I was on my own. I was literally driving, leaving a crowd at 4 o'clock in the morning, driving to a mines, Takwa specifically, sometimes leaving there at 10 o'clock at night and driving back to Accra on my own. I know that road very well now. And today you have how many workers? Um, it's just over, over 300. Um, probably pushing on 350 to be exact. I don't know the exact number, but somewhere around there. All right, uh, this is Time with the Captain's Life here on TV3. Our guest is the managing director of Zen Petroleum, William Tewia. He's a full-blooded Ghanaian, aren't you? Um, pretty much. Um, <laughs> grew, up, um, grew up in Salt Pond. Um, you know, spoke Fanti 99% of the time. Came to Accra when I was um, 11, 12 years old and at that time, I was convinced I was in New York City compared to, <laughs> to Salt Pond. And um, that was pretty much my life ambition achieved. All I wanted to do was to see how Accra looked like. Mm. So everything else is a blessing. A round of applause for him, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Thesson from Gimpa. I wanted to know, sir, please, what kind of leadership skills are you using or have you used for the past years to get you where you are? I've got no idea. I mean, I, 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 just, I just do what I can. I mean, it's, it's, it's halfway time. I, I think it's pretty much common sense. I mean, y you know, our, our, all our mothers have leadership skills. Did they go and learn it in school? They didn't. If you do a wrong thing, you get a slap. If you do a right thing, you get encouraged. It's, um, I think sometimes we have a habit of, you know, complicating things in our own mind. You know, if you're running a business, if you're running a barber shop or you're running a multinational business, you pretty much need the same skills if you want to be successful. It's just that one is a little bit more complicated than the other. You know, but getting too obsessed in leadership skills and this and that, I think it ends up confusing us. You know, if you run a business, what you're fundamentally doing is providing a service and you want to get a fee for it. And you want to make sure that if you make a profit of, of $10 or 10 CDs, you can pay your employees, you can pay your overheads, you can pay your taxes, you know, and uh, make something at the end of it. How you go about it, if you're passionate about it and you think about it and you, you go on, you, you, try, you keep trying different things, you get there in the end. And also, I think we've got this thing in our head that, you know, if you're running, you know, if, if you're a managing director of a bank, you've got more leadership skills than, you know, a lady in Makula Market, you know, who is running numerous businesses. She also has leadership skills, but she can't articulate it to you in the same way as you're learning from Gimpa. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have any skills, because if she didn't, she wouldn't be building an empire or running a business the way she is. So I think the, the question you ask is not irrelevant, but I think um, we overcomplicate it. If you ask me what my leadership skills are, I've got absolutely no idea. I can't tell you. You probably have to ask the, you know, some of the people that work at Zen. You know, but I have, um, I have a way of going, on, going about things. I believe passionately in, in what we're doing. Um, I want to build a very successful and proud Ghanaian business um, to prove our multinational competitors wrong. I want to provide a good service. Um, I want to do things cheaper than my competitor can, um, can do the same thing for. And I want us to innovate. You know, I don't have all the ideas, but we have a, a fairly young team. I mean, if you look at our retail business, um, it's run by four or five um, fairly young guys who are, and, and ladies as well, who are fairly um, inexperienced, somebody might say. But if you don't have any experience, you ask more questions. Quickly in a minute, yes. what's been your 
greatest challenge in, in, in your business? My greatest challenge has been managing the perceptions that Ghanaian businesses are useless. That's my greatest challenge. You know, the perception out there is that if you're a Ghanaian and you're running a business, then it means that you're not doing something right. It means you're not paying your taxes. It means you don't pay your employees. It means you borrow money and you don't care about paying back. Unfortunately, you know, as brilliant as, as, as some, of, um, you know, some of us are, well, some of our, you know, they're, they're very brilliant Ghanaians out there. If we work for multinationals, if we work for these big companies, we assume that they're fine. But as soon as they start working for a Ghanaian company, they think that these bad habits are, are going to start coming up. And so people deep down inside get very nervous when they're dealing with Ghanaian companies. They think it's only a matter of time. We've had Ghanaian companies that have failed. We've also had American companies, European companies that have failed. But every time a Ghanaian company fails, we assume that everyone else after them is going to fail as well. And that has been my biggest challenge. What we have been trying to tell everybody, our customers and everyone else, is that, yes, we're Ghanaian. We're very proud of that. But we're running a much better company than most of our multinational competitors in Ghana. And we don't even compare ourselves with companies in Ghana. We compare ourselves with any company anywhere in the world. We believe that we're running a very, very tight, professional, transparent, disciplined outfit. Please give it up for him. You're still watching Time with the Captain's Live here on TV through our guests for the month of March as a managing director of Zen Petrillo, Mr. William Terrier. We'll take a short commercial break. When we return, we've got more questions to ask him about leadership, entrepreneurship, and business. Uh, you hear from managing directors and CEOs a lot. Uh, and the talk is that, <coughs> you know, a lot of the students that are coming out from the universities these days do not meet the, the industry standard, you know, what the job market is looking for. Do you get that impression as well? Um, I mean, ye yes and no. You know, like, like anywhere else, some of them might meet the standard, some of them might not meet the standard. What is the standard? What are the CEOs looking for? Um, CEOs are... Uh, are you looking are for first class? Um, not, not necessarily. I mean, you're looking for a mixture of things. I, I never went to university myself, so I'm, I'm not there. I'm not going to sit here and start judging somebody who is, who is at least gone through, gone through the curriculum. For me personally, what I look for, the skills that I look for are... Uh, you know, you have to be honest, reliable, hardworking. Those things for us is mo a lot more important than, than a fancy university degree. You know, the university degree is the icing on the cake. Um, if, if, you're, if you're very clever, you've been to university, um, you know, you've been to a good university, you've learned something out there, of course, you know, you're going to add more value. Um, but it doesn't mean that without a university degree, you cannot, you cannot add value. Um, and as I said, the qualities that I look for is, is hard work, you know, um, people who are willing to go the extra mile, you know, people who want to be honest and transparent. Those are, those are a lot more valuable skills for us. These are values? They're values, yes. Um, university is all academics. I mean, I've, I've, once you're done with university, now it's, you, you come to practical experience. And um, if you don't have those values, your university degree means absolutely nothing. You know, if, if you come out with some fancy degree and you can't turn up a work on time, you're just wasting your time, and you've wasted your time going to school as well. <laughs> Who has a microphone? My name is... No, 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 use a microphone. It's not working. Okay, sorry. My name is Aisha Gimpa, and then I would like to ask you your take or your, um, what you think about partnering when you want to start a business, is this something good, or it's something you have to consider after you've, I mean, you've grown, th you've grown to a certain point into the business? Partnerships. Partnership, yeah. Yeah, partnerships is um, again there isn't a, a right or wrong answer. You know, like like friendships, like any other partnership. It's um, if you get the right partner, if you have complementary skills, it can be absolutely fantastic. If you get the wrong partner, it can be a nightmare. So, you know, the idea of having a partner is you share the, the load, you share the ups and the downs, but if you get a wrong partner, you're just going to share the upsides, but you won't be sharing the downsides. So it's all about finding the right person, somebody who complements what you already have. Next question. Another lady. 
You need the microphone. Kindly pass over the microphone. <clears throat> when you had this dream of starting your business, did you have people believe in you? What did your friends say to you? Um, I think um, a lot of people thought that we were just just a bunch of jokers. <laughs> you know, just um, you know, doing a business with pretty much no margins on there, working for free. You know, didn't didn't make sense to a lot of people. But you know, the the way I saw it was, it wasn't so much how much money you're going to make in your in your first year. It's about what experiences you're going to learn, how you can scale the, the business up. So the experience was everything. Um, we talk about education, we talk about going to university. You pay to go to university to learn something that you think can um, add value to your career later on. I was getting a free opportunity to, to do the same um, by supplying fuel to a, to a mining company. And the experience that I get there is what I saw as my, my capital and for future f future growth, so you didn't mind doing it for free. Absolutely not. I mean, if if you just just imagine that you're you're a random footballer kicking a ball around, and Manchester United calls you up for trials, you're not going to ask them for a hundred thousand dollars to show up. You go up there for free because should they be interested in taking you further, that's where you get your money from. The break that Goldfields gave us was a once in lifetime opportunity to. First of all, vindicate the confidence that they had in me to deliver, and also to learn something which I can leverage off you know, at growing the business at a later stage. And that's exactly what happened. So if you're running a business, I'd like to think that you don't want to be in business for one year or two years. You want to be in for the long haul. So how much money you make in your first year, second year, third year, it doesn't really matter. It's about how sustainable the business is and how long you can keep it going for. We've got six more minutes. I need to take your questions thick and fast. Quickly, you, your name. My, my name is Angela. I'm from Gimpa. I want to know, when you started the business, I'm sure you didn't have everything that easy. So did you have, at any point, feel like you couldn't go on um, running the business? And if you did, how did you manage it? Um, I didn't feel like that on the first day only. I still feel like that sometimes today. <laughs> um, if you're running a business and you don't have challenges, then there's something seriously wrong. And every day you're going to have a thousand and one things to worry about. You're going to have 10 problems every day. At the very least, if you're lucky, you have to decide which ones to focus on and which ones to put at the back of your mind. So challenge comes with the territory. It's the way you manage it that's going to make the difference. Next question. A gentleman, quickly. My name is Anthony. Um, with the Presently, you, you have received an award last year, and also with the introduction of the low su sulfur diesel. I want to know how you classify your performance so far. Thank you. Um, I think it's, it's, it's always difficult when, you, you know, when, you, when I get asked that question. I'd like to think that we're doing something right, because we're still in business. You're not sure you're doing something right? I'd like to think we are, but mm. at the end of the day, it's your customers that, that will determine that. We're still growing as a business. Every day, every year, we've done more than we did the previous year, so I'd like to think that we're doing well. I think, you know, for me, it's not about what I did yesterday, it's what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, low sulfur was something that happened uh, two, three years ago. It's about what new innovations we're going to come up with tomorrow. That's what's going to make the difference as to whether we're around for another 10 or 20 years or whether we're going to disappear. Next question. My name is Daniel from Gimpa. Um, how are you able to convince Goldfields that although you don't have any background in petroleum, you'll be able to supply them with good quality petrol or fuel? Um, as I said, I spent the um, best part of six months trying to understand the downstream petroleum sector before we had the opportunity to actually present to them. So I drew the supply chain. I told them that you know there's a chance that I've missed something, but I didn't think so. and. Um, you know, I was, I was open and transparent with them. I told them, yes, I've never done it before, but this is my understanding of it. I'm willing to, to concede if somebody can pick holes in their presentation that I've, I've missed something. Um, fortunately, um, they, they, they had enough confidence to, to award, and um, you know, we, we didn't miss anything as it happens, and you know, we're able to, um, to deliver on our promises. And the rest is history. Yes. OK, my name is Bernard. And I want to ask that most startups within the first to second year do collapse due to one or two reasons. But yours have gone past that, and even you are in your 10th year. Mm -hmm. um, what, 
one advice will you give to a startup entrepreneur who is beginning? Secondly, beginning a business always is difficult with um, startup capital. What will you advise a startup entrepreneur again when it comes to that particular Thank aspect? You. Okay, so the first question is, um, how do you survive your first two years? It's, um, there's no difference between what happens in your first two years and what happens in your 10th year. Every, every day when you wake up in the morning, there's a chance that you can make a mistake that's going to kill you off for life. So every day is a challenge. You need to keep your eyes wide open. You need to look at every single thing and find out what you can do better tomorrow and improve on what you did yesterday. Um, if you think that you, you, you survive your first two years and you think you're home and dry, you've got another thing coming. So every day is a challenge. You need to look at things every day and try to improve. In terms of startup capital, my advice to everyone here is that as much as possible, try not to go and borrow money from any bank to start up your business. Um, you'll be surprised by how much money you can actually save. Um, and if you start you know, relying too much on bank financing, we, we often make the excuse that you know, we can't raise money so we can't start a business. Of course you can start a business. You know, look for, try to understand first of all if you need money in the first place because you might be going to a business where you don't actually need money. You know, maybe you can find a partner who is part financing it. But a lot of the time, people come up with a business idea, they don't spend a, enough time researching it, and they're just relying on a bank to give you a big check to finance it. And that's where your problems actually start, because that bank is charging you interest weekends, weekdays, 24-7. So try not to rely on bank financing if you possibly can. Try to look for creative ways of saving money and being efficient with your money. All right. All right, thank you very much. I've got a final say for a final question. You started off with gold fields. Mm -hmm. Over the years, you've enhanced your portfolio. You are working in other African countries. Do you think your success today is as a result of just being smart, or you think a bit of luck has played in? Luck always plays into any business. Any business person that tells you he hasn't been lucky is lying to you. Okay, you can have two, three people doing exactly the same thing, running the same business, but not all of them will succeed. So luck definitely plays a, a big part in it, but to a large extent, you also make your own luck. The harder you work, the less re um, reliant you have to be on luck. Um, the more questions you ask about your business, the, the better your team, the more you invest in f having good people around you, the more likely it is that you don't have to rely too much on luck. You know, the, 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 less, the, the less effort you put in, the, the more likely it is that you have to rely on luck. So luck definitely plays a part. And there's absolutely no way I can sit here and tell anyone that you know, we haven't been lucky. But we try to mitigate that by working, going the extra mile, by working hard, by looking for good people who can add value. Show him some love, ladies and gentlemen. Show him some love. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been Time with the Captains live here on TV3. We also stream live on Facebook. My guest for the month of March has been the managing director of Zen Petrillo, Mr. William Terry. It's been an exciting edition of Time with the Captains here on TV3. Thanks also to uh, the students from the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration also for joining us with your fantastic questions. My name is Park Wissi Asari. Thanks also to the production team, uh, to the technicians, to all of you for uh, spending time with us uh, and being on the show with us uh, tonight. God willing, same time next month, we'll come your way with yet another exciting edition of your favorite program, Time with the Captains. Bye-bye. <laughs>